includes integrated document records and web content management. You have the business process, which is server-based forms and workflow with smart, um, smart client browser interfaces. And then you have the business intelligence features, which you can have server-based spreadsheet, spreadsheets plus BI portals built in SQL server analysis service, services. You can also um, combine performance point and use SharePoint um, as your dashboarding. This shows that SharePoint is a single platform for many portal types. Whether you are running an extranet, intranet, intranet, enterprise, division, team, and individual. Hold on, guys, it's not loading. Let's go back here. Okay, so my slide isn't loading right here, but just to give you a, a quick overview. Um, SharePoint is able to integrate easily with existing line of business applications and give you new usefulness or even give you a new audience that you didn't have before, such with using uh, integrating with SAP, data warehouse, and, and other applications. Now, while SharePoint installations can support as team workspaces, they can quickly grow to encompass information sharing across your entire division. This is when organiza organizations start to outgrow their early deployment and they need a planned approach. And that's when such companies like Needasset get involved to come in to, the, to your business to give you guys a planned approach. Okay, now we're going to talk about the powerful but underutilized SharePoint features. The Business Data Catalog. What is the Business Data Catalog? The Business Data Catalog is a shared service facility that integrates backend systems and line of business application data with your SharePoint application. Some of the reasons you want to use the BDC, which allows you to populate or enhance your SharePoint list, web parts, search results, user profiles, and just so you can get more data from external sources. Um, this also offers you the possibility of displaying data or creating new application functionality without having to write formal code. Some of the limitations of the BDC, um, it's great for querying external sources. However, it's not great for updating data stored in external sources. What a lot of people don't understand is the BDC is read-only. So you can only pull that data and populate it into SharePoint. So um, the BDC is part of the shared services. Here's an overview real quick of the BDC architecture. And this just shows you how SharePoint can, how you can, the BDC can be used with SharePoint lists and other user profile information. I kind of have this one up here for all the techies. So now I'm going to turn it over to Scott. So he's going to give us a quick overview, a quick demonstration of the BDC. All right. Thanks, Christina. Um, yeah, so like, like she was mentioning, this, uh, this slide kind of shows all the different interconnected uh, pieces that the BDC can interact with. So you can use the BDC to interact with your, your built-in SharePoint list, the search features, user profiling and targeting, uh, things like that. So what we're going to do is, is go through a quick demonstration, a live demo, uh, showing uh, just how quickly the BDC can, can bring some of this uh, uh, third-party data uh, into your SharePoint um, application. So let me go ahead and share my virtual here. And everybody let me know if, that, if that's coming through. You see that, Christina? That's good. Okay. Uh, and also, uh, I'll try to go slow here. So I realize that a uh, live meeting can sometimes have a little bit of a lag to it. So, But uh, please feel free to, to speak up if, you, if you're not able to follow along. So, uh, basically, what, let's start with a, a potential third-party data source. Now, the BDC can interact with a lot of, of different uh, uh, third-party data sources, um, such as uh, web services or maybe an Oracle database or maybe there's an SAP installation that you'd like to leverage. Uh, what I'm going to do here to kind of uh, replicate that or, or emulate that is is just access some data that we've got stored in the SQL Server database uh, on the same server in this case. So I've got the old AdventureWorks database we're all familiar with. And uh, what I'd really like to do is bring out some salesperson, uh, sales, salesperson data to, the, to my SharePoint application. And I'd like to uh, you know, do that with a minimum amount of code. And uh, uh, I'd also like to tie that in with some existing SharePoint data. So I found that the... The best way to do that uh, is to use a, a third-party tool, uh, but you can also choose to write your own um, BDC definitions. 
So the blog code for this is BDC Metaman. Uh, it's got a an open source, uh, or I'm sorry, a, a freeware version that you can download and use, but then there's the, the uh, paid version that has uh, upgraded capabilities as well. But first things first, let me go into my central administration and uh, go ahead and remove the old BDC definitions that I have in there. So like Christina mentioned earlier, uh, BDBC is part of the shared services provider, uh, which is both a blessing and a curse in that uh, it can be somewhat of a bottleneck uh, in, the, in, the shared services, um, in the shared services provider. But the, the advantage is that it's shared across all, the, all of your, uh, your application farms so that you know, any, any piece of your SharePoint site can, can access um, whatever stored there. So I'm going to go in and view application. I'm going to go ahead and delete this guy so I can show you the entire workflow. Okay, so using BDC MetaMan, um, I'm going to go ahead and set my configuration options. Uh, so here I want to browse to a local file where I'm going to save my BDC definition. And that looks just fine. I'm going to just overwrite what I had there. So yeah. Um, namespace, I'm going to set towards to adventure world, that's fine. Uh, the Moss Shared Services Provider, so this is simply a reference to my existing uh, shared services provider that I was just showing you the administrative uh, uh, administrative pages for. So it's Shared Services 1, typically that's the name that's given, but it can be anything. Uh, Localhost, and in this case, uh, port 3344. So I'm going to go ahead and save that as my configuration. And then this particular tool gives me the option to connect to a data source. So I'm going to say SQL Server. All right. And in this case, I want a SQL Server 2005. Looks good. Which is on localhost. And I'm going to go ahead and use Windows Authentication. You can see some of the other options here, Web Services, MS Access. There's an Oracle provider. Uh, this tool uh, gives you a lot of different options. So we go ahead and connect. And then we'll get a, a listing of all the uh, databases available in that instance. And I'll go ahead and open AdventureWorks. And I'll scroll down to sales.salesperson, which is what we were interested in. So uh, this tool is nice and that all I have to do is drag over <coughs> this table and it automatically populate the definition file from that. Um, you can also drag in other tables and link them much like you would in uh, SQL Server um, Studio. In this case, I just want to pull in this one table. So now that I'm happy with that, I simply generate the application definition file. And it gives me a message saying you should consider upgrading to the professional version. I say OK. And it says, would you like to open a file in your registered XML editor? In this case, let's do that so that we can get a sample of what we would have to do without a tool. We would we would have to code the actual definition file using XML. So let's just get a quick look at what that looks like. So here's the actual uh, XML file that's generated on our behalf. Um, so this is what we would actually have to go through and write uh, as our BDC definition. So this has saved us a lot of time, as you can see. <laughs> So here's the, the columns we're interested in of that table. And it's got other information. Um, so let's go ahead and import that into our shared services provider. So import application definition. We can go ahead and browse to that. I'll give everybody a second to update here. That's good. Okay. And we'll browse to that. And there it is, trusty adventure work sales and, and the definition files folder that I saved it in. Say OK. And everything else looks good. We don't want to set any permissions. We want uh, pretty much the default here. So let's go ahead and import. OK, so this was successfully imported. Great. OK. So what we can do now is I'm going back to my <coughs> SharePoint application. 
And I would like to add this in on this web on this default web page I'm looking at. Uh, so let's go ahead and go ahead and add it in as a web part. And we want to scroll down to some of the business data web parts that are available out of the box with SharePoint. So you can see here there's a lot of choices. But let's go with a business data list. We want to return a list of items from the data source in the catalog. So let's add that in. Okay, so now it dropped the web part on the page. <clears throat> let's go ahead and configure it. I just did a modify shared web part. And we start off with the type, the business data type. Uh, luckily, we have this nice browse function, and it comes right up. So these, this will list out all the uh, application definitions that you've stored in your uh, shared services provider. So I say OK. And let's go ahead and apply that. So there's all the data that came out of that table. But I noticed that some of this is, is, I'm not really interested in displaying some of this. So let's go ahead and edit this view. Let's go ahead and say, I don't want to use the modified data anymore. Or the row, good. Everything else looks okay though. Let's keep all of those. And let's limit the list to say 10 items. Let's say okay. And that's much better to look at. So, <clears throat> Here we've got a nice little page control, so we can go through the next the next ten items in the list. Um, but let's go ahead and modify that again, and let's go in the XSL editor. So this will show you how just how easy it is to customize the presentation of, of all the, your different data pieces. So uh, if I go into the XSL editor, I'm handy with XSLT. I can find out. I can find. <clears throat> Excuse me, the row definitions. Let me do some quick searching. Bear with me here. Just to give you guys a little tip, um, I install, I have uh, something called Editpad Pro. I know there's uh, other text editors. A lot of the times I'll just take that and copy and paste it into there, and it'll automatically color code it for me. So I'll go ahead and make my changes, and I'll, I'll you know, paste it back into the, the dialog. So, um, here. I'm having trouble finding it, so give me a second here. We did have one question that came up. I know we said we were going to hold them all till the end, but I yep. think this might be relevant for the okay. presentation. So the question that came in was, what SharePoint version was assumed in this presentation? Oh, to that MOS 2007. Okay. Yes, I forgot to include that one. Thank you. Let's go ahead and change the background color really quickly. This is a very simple demonstration, but um, you know, should show you just how easy it can be to customize the display without having to go through custom code. So I'll go ahead and save that, Let's apply the changes. And I changed everything to gold background. That's a very simple demonstration, doesn't really do much for me, but um, you know, with a, with a little more work we can we can customize the look and feel of this table to, to however we would like it to, to be and even customize interaction. So now that we've got that, click OK. So that looks good. So that's the <coughs> The salesperson data out of an external uh, data source. Uh, in this case, it happens to be a SQL Server uh, table, but it could easily be a web service, could easily be a different type of database. There's many different integration options there. So let's go ahead and combine that with some SharePoint data, though, and, and see if we can make it even more useful. So I'm going to go ahead to <coughs> create, site actions, create. <coughs> And let's create a new custom list here. So let's call this uh, sales person filter. All right. We don't want it on a quick launch. Go ahead and create that. So what we should do here is tweak the settings. 
So right now we've got title created by, modified by, and there's some probably some other ones uh, hidden as well. Uh, title looks good, but let's create another column to tie this all together called territory ID, which is one of the fields that came across from the original database. So let's, I happen to know that that's a number. I could give it a description there. Um, I'm going to require that we have a value there. Let's say minimum of 1, maximum of 10, and let's have zero decimal places, and everything else looks good. Okay. So then let's go ahead and uh, add some values to this to this uh, list, the SharePoint list. So just to make things easy on myself, I'm going to edit in data sheet view. I'm going to say, let's say this is the West region, and that has a territory ID of 1. And then let's say we have the East region, territory ID of 2. Okay, we have the South West region with the territory ID of 3. So that looks good. I'm happy with that. Um, yes. So let's save those changes. Then let's go ahead and go back to list settings. And I want to create a new view for this. So let's pick a standard view, and we'll call this filter view because we're not very original. And I want to show the title and the territory ID. So those both look good, title and territory ID. Everything else looks good. And say OK. So now we've got this new view with the territory ID and the title. So back on the home page. I was working from. So you notice here we have the territory ID, but we don't we don't know what region that's from. So let's tie that together with some SharePoint data to uh, to get a better view of these these uh, data items. So <clears throat> let's edit the page, and here we'll drop in a filter web part. So let's go down the list until we find filters. And there's the filters. In this case, we're talking about a SharePoint list filter. So we're filtering data somewhere else on the page from a SharePoint list. So let's add that in. All right. Let's go ahead and modify this web part. So let's give this a name. This is what's going to appear in the title if we choose to have the title uh, showing. So let's give it a you know, you know, person filter. And let's select the list. So let's go current site. And where was the one we created? Salesperson filter value. There it is. So that's the list we just created. All right. Now, which view do we want to use? Well, we created that filter view. What value do we want to use to filter the list on? We want to use the territory ID value, but we want to describe it with the title. And everything else looks good. So I'll go ahead and say OK. But now it gives me a warning message the filter hasn't been connected. So it's not filtering any of these web parts that would be subscribing to that. So let's go ahead and connect. I want connections, send filter values to. We want to send it to this web part, the sales person list. And let's see, what kind of connections do we want? We want to get filter values from, or we want to get query values from. Well, we've already got the query, so let's get the filter values from. And then which field do we want to filter on? Well, in this case, we want to filter on territory ID. So I'll select that one right there. I'll say finish. And voila. Let's exit the edit mode and see how this works. So I've got my original list. But let's go ahead and select. Now we've got names instead of territory IDs. So Southwest region, pulling from a SharePoint list. And now it filters by your salespeople in your Southwest region. So territory three. And that's it. That's, that's kind of an example that'll show you just how quickly you can build a data integration uh, using SharePoint's out of the box features. Great. All right. Um, there we go. All right. So now what we're going to talk about is the content query web part. Uh, what is the content query web part? This is an awesome web part that's available in MOS 2007, and the content query web part is used to create custom views of SharePoint data. 
Um, one of the biggest complaints before was the way that the data would be displayed within SharePoint. Hence, Content Query Web Part has now come into play. Um, some of the reasons for using the Content Query Web Part is because it allows you to populate or enhance your SharePoint lists, your web parts, your search results, your user profiles, and more with data from external sources. This offers the possibility of displaying data or creating new application functionality without having to write formal code. So what we're going to go ahead real quick and have turn it back over to Scott and let him demo just a brief thing about the Content Query Web Part. Okay. The other thing we're going to do is also show you three different websites that's using, that are SharePoint sites that are using Content Query Web Part. Okay. Can everybody see this? Can you scroll? The uh, web part's cut off. Can you scroll the uh... Is that showing, Kristen? Yes. Okay. So on this right side, in the interest of saving some time, I've got an announcement uh, web part and a content query web part example that I want to show everybody. So let's first go to the announcement. So what I've done here is um, let me just show you the original list here. So give it a second to update. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yep, you're good. Oh, okay. Okay. There you go. So here's the announcement list. And this is a standard announcement list that comes with SharePoint. Uh, I'm not going to uh, modify that too heavily. So I've got all the announcements. Let's take a quick look at it. Oh, tell them what field uh, you added it in. Right. Okay, so, there you go. So here's, here's the announcements list. And basically what I've done is I added another column to the standard announcements list called the announcement image URL. And it's just an image type. Um, so I uploaded images for each of my announcements. So. Uh, what you'll notice there is that in the original page, and you're using the original announcements web part that you can drop in, you won't see any, the imagery because it's, it's not coded to, to display that. What you'll see is the title, and then who's created by the date, and some text uh, that actually came with the, the announcement. So um, what I did here on the bottom was, I used, using an XSLT transform, I created a different view of that announcement data. So here you can see that I've added in the image. I have a quick uh, title that's linked to the actual announcement and has a date, and then it has a blurb from the actual uh, content, but then I've, I've actually added in a more link here that links you to, the again, the announcement in the announcement list. So, what, you, what, what you're showing here is that you can pull different data items using an XSL uh, transform, and you can, uh, you can customize your display with a minimum amount of code. Um, now, in this case, you know, the XSL transform, I can show you this. It's, a, it's actually this document here. So there's a fair amount of, of coding that, that goes into this, but if you're handy with XSLT, you can, you can create this XSLT and then utilize it in your standard web parts to have everything take on a completely new look. So uh, there's no code involved in this except for the, the actual XML, uh, XML to HTML XSLT. So you can see how it's building div tags and BRs here, and uh, it even has classes for the CSS style. So it, this is just building the HTML that's, that's pumping out of, of this web part. So some good examples of this that we wanted to take you through uh, or sites like Kroger. This is the actual, you know, internet uh, Kroger.com website. You'd never know to look at it, but this is a SharePoint site. Um, and hey, this section Scott, right you, here. Did uh, you change your, uh, yeah, the color is off again. Oh, man, okay. Thanks for telling me that. Um, no yeah. So uh, one of the things that I find is that a lot of our customers have thought of SharePoint, they, I mean, they, they've dealt with SharePoint 2003, and they're, they're new to MOSS 2007, and what they haven't understood is that SharePoint is more than just a collaboration tool. It, it's, it's more than just having to, you know, it, it can be more than just an intranet. So these are examples of extranets of external sites that they're actually using SharePoint for the con web content management features. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, SharePoint... I, uh, can be used in, in a lot of different situations, and you can leverage that investment um, across many different portal sites. So you know, here we've got the Kroger.com site. Hopefully you can see that in full 24-bit color now. Yes, it looks better. Okay. And then right here on their on their 
home page, you see this articles and information section, and that's actually a, I'm sorry, what was that? Scroll down a little bit so we can see that. Sure. That show? It's showing just the top of it. Okay. That's weird. Perfect. Okay. So right here, we have the articles and information section, and just, just like before, we've got the image, the title, but this one doesn't have a link in the title. Um, a, maybe one or two lines of the actual description, and then the link to the actual item. And this is all content query web part right here. And what basically happens is that query takes uh, the, the latest uh, additions to this list, and you can see there's that image that you saw on the home page isn't here because it doesn't exist in this view, but it's definitely attached to that item. And uh, Kroger, whenever they have a new uh, item that they want to release to the website, you know, they just add it to the list and add the imagery and the text. And then the content query web part uh, pulls that all out and displays it on the front of the page. And here's another site, Hawaiian Airlines, same, same thing. Um, if you look down at the bottom here, can you see this, Christina? It's still loading. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's still loading. Okay. Keep it at the top. Oh, no, you can go down the bottom now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so down here at the bottom where they have their uh, their special offers, you know, these are time-limited offers, so they occasionally come up with new ones. These are This is all content query web part that's pulling the same, the same way out of uh, a list that they have, um, and this is all in SharePoint. And the same concept with Energizer. Uh, you got Energizer.com here. I'm going to wait for everybody to update. Can you give it a second? Yeah. This one's a little, a little more uh, involved. So it, on the right side, you have current promotions. And they've got a, a completely different way of doing that. But you can see that these are all, this is all behind the scenes content query web part even though it may not look like SharePoint in any way. So this is all a SharePoint page, all strip, completely SharePoint. Right? So. Great. All right. I'm trying to get back to the – there we go. All right. Thanks for that, Scott. Sure. All right. Now we're going to talk about SharePoint Designer. What is SharePoint Designer? Um, SharePoint Designer is a tool that allows you to quickly modify the SharePoint site. You can create new – page layouts, content features, pages, etc. The features of SharePoint Designer is that it's a WYSIWYG editor. It also allows you to check in and check out and version the content pieces. This allows sites administrators to maintain the control of the site. Some of the drawbacks, um, you must pay attention to customize, formerly known as unghosted pages. This is a powerful tool and it should only be used by well SharePoint designers. Um, a lot of the things that, uh, a lot of the ways that the features and solutions and master pages are being deployed now, uh, or a lot of the ways that the page layouts and the master pages are being deployed now are through features and solutions. But, um, you know, SharePoint Designer is a quick way to go in to be able to create your pages, et cetera. Okay. So uh, let's go back to the next one. Now we're going to talk about the SharePoint customization options. What SharePoint, the difference between SharePoint 2003 and SharePoint 2007 is the, uh, the, the ability to do master pages and page layouts. The MOS 2007 is built off the .NET architecture. So with the custom master pages, what you're able to do is define the general look and feel, and it's style sheet driven. So what the master page includes are some of the common, uh, common controls for the site, which is the top and left navigation. You have your logo, um, search fields. You can put that where you want. You have your page editing controls your login controls, and any other custom controls you decide to create. There's two types of master pages, which is the system master page and the site master page. The benefits of master pages is that you can change the entire look of your site. MOS 2007 is much easier to customize than SharePoint 2003. Um, the other thing you can do is hide unwanted SharePoint components. The problem I've seen people have, customers have done in the past is actually delete components Never, never, never delete the components. What you want to do is hide the unwanted components because you may have a component that's needed somewhere else. And what happens is it's calling it in the page, but it's not showing it. So if you delete it, you're going to end up with errors on your SharePoint site. Um, the other thing this does, it allows you to alter the layout of the page in addition to changing the colors, images, and 
the page layout, this, doing all, the custom master pages will not affect the underscore layout pages. So here you got here. So you have your master page, which is back. That's you got your master page, and then you have your page layout, which is overlapping right here. That's your page layout.aspx or whatever page layout you created. So you have your master page dot master. So here on the on the page layout is where you're going to have all your web part zones, and then your field controls, etc. Now uh, I'm going to talk about custom site definitions. What is a custom site definition? Custom site definition is the complete description for the structure of the SharePoint site. The site template is what the temp are the templates that are contain the differences from the original site definition that it's based on. Um, site definition components. Oops, yeah, thing got a little messed up here. Um, the things to include in the, the site definition components are configuration, including list templates, web parts, web part module pages, modules. Um, the list templates that describe each type of list, basic field and global settings, your file types to be added to the SharePoint site and how those files should be configured, the navigation bar, look and feel. The navigation bar is the area on top of the page that typically displays home, documents, lists, etc. So now we're going to talk about the web content management, WCM. And when you have the enterprise portal solution in your in your corp in your environment, you want to have it divide it out to how you're going to manage your portal. So typically how, it is, how we recommend is you have your site managers, you have your site designers, and your web developers. And they're responsible for the site structure, the templates, the site design, integration, business rules, security. So they're going to do the, the page layouts, the master pages, the style sheets, the structure of the site. And then once you have that deployed, then you're going to have your business, business managers and your business users and content creators who are actually going to create the content. So they'll do content creation. They'll go through the approval, the publishing, the scheduling, the archiving, the versioning. So then you have, then you go through, once everything's approved, you go through your workflow process to have it push out to your, your you know, to where your content is pushing to. Um, content reuse. This is one of the big things that you can utilize in SharePoint. And um, Scott, I'll let you cover this slide. Sure, sure. Okay, so you know, one of the <clears throat> one of the common uh, themes that's used in web content management is the idea that you know pieces of content can be reused. Um, some of the things we commonly see is that an, an organization will have many different operations. So you have an Asia Pacific branch and a North America branch, but uh, they use some shared components, uh, and you don't want to have to update all these different uh, all these different sites uh, independently. So uh, just like all the other uh, web content management uh, solutions, why not have the same features and functionalities in that you're, you're able to store uh, different content fragments and reuse those across all the different um, uh, different uh, portals and sites that you create in SharePoint. So if, I think in this example here, we're showing a, a copyright tag. So if that ever changes, um, instead of pushing that out to, you know, five different websites independently, uh, in SharePoint, it's completely uh, completely possible and it's indeed the best practice to change it in that one location, and that is, that change when it's when it's pushed out affects all of the sites that uh, leverage that piece of reusable content. So this slide basically shows that progression of fragments to actual HTML, which is referenced by uh, any page in the SharePoint uh, in your SharePoint universe. Um, now we have the authoring and content management, controlling the authoring process. You have your page check in and check out. You have your drafts where you can set, you know, to publish a major or minor versions. You have your heavy, heavily customized workflow system. You have out of the box approval workflow and review workflow. You have SharePoint designer workflow, and then you have customized workflow that you can do through Visual Studio. So that there. It, there's a number of things you can do based upon the solution that you need to provide a workflow that best fit your 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 business. Right. So. I just wanted to interject. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the things we we see on, on our side is is uh, you know clients who want to have a definite process for rolling out new content. And they want to have approval, um, and a lot of times they you know IT has to be involved in all of those changes, um, whether they want to or not. So. Uh, a lot of what this allows you to do is really 
put separation between these different layers and, and give people enough control uh, that they feel, you know, that they have uh, an effect on things, but then rein in that control and have a, a, a specific approval process. So. Okay. Another benefit you have um, is the multi multi-language sites, multi-device sites, and multi-branded sites. Um, okay, top ten reasons SharePoint projects fail. Scott and I both have a lot of experience in this. Um, so, number one, writing too much code, not leveraging out-of-the-box SharePoint features. I just went through an ex uh, a, a recent situation where there was a developer who just did not understand some of the features in SharePoint. So, instead of using the con content query web part and using the XSLT to display the, the roll-up information that they wanted, they decided to go write custom web parts. So instead of understanding what, so instead of using the out-of-box feature, the, the developer decided, I'm just going to make custom web part because I don't, I don't understand. This is new to me. I don't understand how it works. So that's why it's really important to have, train your employees, train the people that are going to support your portal so they can have an understanding of how it works and how to best utilize out of the box features and when you need to actually customize features. Okay? So the second one is selling to analyze the specific, the specific performance considerations and implementation, implementation, sorry guys, I'm having speaking issues today, and taking these into account into the application architecture. Um, not deciding on clear content and code migration strategies. I'm sure that Scott keeps can talk on some of these. Oh sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so so exactly. Um, you know, SharePoint's a different animal. It's it's a it's really a two-tier architecture instead of like a three or or n-tier architecture. Um, it has different uh, content and code migration um, constraints. So it's really important to you know decide on your strategy. I think in any organization or with any product, but you know, particularly with SharePoint, you, know, you really want to consider uh, how you're pushing content out, how you're pushing code out. Uh, through the different, you know, levels of development, staging, production, testing, all those different things. Okay, then we have poor site taxonomy. Right, so a, a good example here would be, um, you know, your different uh, organizations. So let's just take New Desi. You know, we have an Austin office and we have a Denver office. Um, so if we had a, a site tax that was organized around our different offices, say we'd have you know, the Denver SharePoint site and the, the Austin SharePoint site. But um, let's take an example where a project happens to be across several different offices. You know, where do those documents live? Do those documents live in, in the Denver SharePoint site or do those documents live in the Austin SharePoint site? Or should we have a, a project-based, you know, taxonomy? So just considering up front, you know, taking that into account can save you a lot of hassle down the road when people are, are you know, not buying into your application because it's hard to find information or the information's not where they expect it. Um, another, number five, another problem we've seen is developing a governance policy. So for example, being able to dictate quotas, not making a decision on viral versus planned, planned deployment. Is there a clear end goal? Number six, not involving experienced SharePoint developers. Kind of ties into number one, not knowing when to use out-of-the-box features, et cetera. But the problem I've seen is where you've had unexperienced SharePoint developers kind of go in and then end up messing up the whole environment because uh, they didn't understand how it works. And a lot of times if, you, if you're if you a .NET developer and you don't understand SharePoint, you're going to do things the way you understand it in .NET. And SharePoint works a little bit differently. So even though things are built off the .NET architecture, a lot of things are database driven. You can't just go in and just keep editing all the IIS settings, et cetera. And so I've seen problems where portals were just destroyed because a non-experienced SharePoint developer was going in and just making all these changes without really understanding what they were doing. Um, number seven, lack of a backup strategy. There are many ways to do this with many pitfalls. Um, to, about this, about backup strategies, Sometimes out of the box will give you what you need. There's other tools, third-party tools that are out there, such as AppPoint. Um, I'm not sure if some of the other ones, but I'm sure Scott does, but that allow you to do more than just site-level backups and restores and farm-level backups and restores where you actually can go down to the document level. Right. Yeah, but a common problem with SharePoint uh, that I'm sure, Christine, you've seen as well is, is you know, uh, 
you know, uh, backing up one site and then migrating it to another uh, another farm, things like that, cross farm backups and, and restores. Um, there's just a lot of trust and pitfalls in, in, in a complicated backup strategy. So it's something you want to consider ahead of time. <laughs> Number eight, another problem that ends up happening is having insufficient commitment um, by, we've seen this, insufficient commitment by our clients in the time and resource investment for all phases of the project. You need to go through the requirements gathering. You need to go through the design session. You need to go through implementation and support. You know, this still is a product that needs to be go through those steps. You can't just roll it out there and think, okay, we're ready to go. There's a lot of things to consider. Um, number nine, failure to employ complete software development and lifecycle methodologies. Once again, it kind of ties into eight, the requirements, design, testing, solutions, features, and instead relying on rapid development choices. Um, you know, doing SharePoint designer, point-click configurations that don't, do not support deployable solutions. So it, it's best to actually take a look at what you're trying to accomplish business-wise. Figure out your site taxonomy. Figure out what, how you want to what the workflow requirements are, everything that's required for the site, so you can figure out what's going to be the best solution. If out of the box is going to be a good choice, what out of the box features you can utilize, and what you actually need to customize, and what kind of solutions and features you need to deploy. So, um, another one, number 10. Another reason why SharePoint projects fail is because not involving user experience and information architecture experts. Instead, the problem is, is a lot of times you just roll it out without having the user experience involved to, to kind of get buy-in. So you roll it out and then you have a problem where your users aren't adapting to it. They don't like it. They don't want to use it. But as long as you kind of get user experience involved, you can slowly adapt people to your environment as well as getting them involved so they have an understanding that, hey, we're a part of this. You're going to deploy this. So it, it include features and, and different things that we want involved in our portal. Anything else, Scott? I, I think that I think that last point, you know, uh, I think the last point is a really powerful one in that, you know, adoption is key. You want people to, you know, leverage their SharePoint architecture um, and really rely on that for, you know, all, all of their needs, collaboration or search or whatever it might be, but it really becomes the information or knowledge base. Uh, and, and then you have people contributing and it becomes this living and breathing thing. You know, without that, you, you – a site where some information is stored, but some information is stored elsewhere or some application features are used elsewhere. Um, you really don't get that whole cohesive experience. So uh, having a, a user experience and information architecture expertise involved in the projects is really important. Okay. Right. Katie on? Thanks, guys. That was really helpful. Um, and I love talking about SharePoint. It's so much fun, partially because we have it internally. Um, here at New Desk, of course, we have our own SharePoint, SharePoint portal. Um, and so we have, definitely have a couple questions. So one of them being, you know, going through that top ten list, it provides so many good questions as far as, you know, from a um, – why we want to implement SharePoint, to what are some good questions to ask, what are my good project plans. Um, but I think, you know, let's start with maybe the first question as far as, if I'm running SharePoint 2003, what are the pros and cons to upgrading to 2007? And a second part to that is, what's a good migration strategy? And what have we seen that works? Christine, do you want to take that one? Uh, you would. <laughs> no, I don't have a, I don't have much experience with the the migration from 03 to 07, unfortunately. So well, okay. I was you would be able to lend me something to that. The uh, here here's the problem. Okay, the benefits you're going to get from migrating is the of course all the, the the workflow capabilities, a lot of the other features that are not in 2003. Um, the problems I've seen is with poor migrations where um, people have gone in and didn't know how to migrate. Um, I, I technically, I, I don't recommend the out-of-the-box migration if you have a very complex portal. I recommend using some third-party migration tool to do your migration. So a lot of times with customers will actually have their existing site, um, they were, were migrating from a content management server. Um, so we'll end up slowly migrating pieces over to, Share, uh, to Modern 2007. Now with SharePoint 2003, we'll do kind of a slow migration 
to kind of make sure uh, if the portal is really big, we'll do a slow migration to make sure that pieces aren't going to break so that we can integrate things very nicely. Okay. And also by doing a slow migration, you have a better um, user buy-in because the interface is, I mean, because the capabilities are a lot more in 2007 um, than 2003, you know, you just need to get used to that adjustment. The other thing is having Office 2003 versus Office 2007. Office 2007 integrates much better with, with SharePoint 2007. Mm -hmm. So if you're running Office 2003, you're going to not, you are going to miss a lot of the built-in features that you have with the new version of Office. Okay. We have another question that says, if you are running WSS 3.0, is there anything, uh, is there anything equivalent to the content query web part in WSS 3.0 or the BDC in WSS 3.0? Unfortunately, those features are not available in WSS 3.0 mm -hmm. because that is the scaled down free version. Okay. So you actually have to upgrade to the enterprise portal version. Okay. BDC, that's what comes, lots, a lot of the features that come with uh, MOS 2007. Okay. Right, anything in the service provider, right, Christine? Yeah, everything in the share service provider is part of the enterprise. Okay. And let's talk a little bit. Oh, we have another question earlier. Scott mentioned the site taxonomy strategy, strategies and an example where companies may have multiple sites and content that needs to be shared among distributed users. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, uh, you know, one of the things you typically see in, in a viral deployment, which is what we like to call it when, say, somebody has a project and they want a way to organize documents and they say, well, let me go try out SharePoint or WSS or, or you know, whatever they, they choose to use as their platform. They have a box on their desk and, and everybody, you know, logs into their local, to his local SharePoint server and they start contributing documents. So that's kind of a viral deployment where you didn't really plan anything, you just wanted to use some collaboration tools and SharePoint happened to be available. So in that in that situation what we see a lot is is, you know, organically you'll have these different sites grow out of that and there's really no taxonomy to speak of. Nobody's really thought through it at least. So there's no there's no formal organization. And this kind of goes back uh, along the lines of governance and planning. So Having a, a clear plan from the outset, uh, from what we've seen, pays you huge dividends later in, in that a lot of the requests we commonly field are for uh, a lot of what we've been talking about here, which is, you know, I have this SharePoint site and I want to add these five features, but I'm having these stumbling points. Um, a lot of that kind of comes out of that lack of planning in the initial stages. So SharePoint's a very flexible product, uh, has a lot of, a lot of features out of the box. Um, but that can also, uh, you know, get you into trouble without the appropriate amount of planning. Mm -hmm. But I hope that answered it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a, a, an add-on to that question that says, if the sites exist under the same collection, oh, I'm sorry, if the sites exist under the same collection, can a list slash libraries be shared across sites? So across, so as long as it's in a single site collection, yes. Well, you can do the roll-up features across the, the – yeah, you can share you can share the information. You just can't do it when it's across multiple site collections. Okay. Um, is that right, Scott? Yep, that's right. Yep. Okay. And then we're talking that, a lot of – I'm sorry, go ahead, Scott. I was just going to say that that kind of – maybe maybe that's another planning question there, you know, where, where maybe if you didn't plan for multiple site collections, now you're in a situation where, you know, that, 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 that kind of lends itself to the taxonomy question. That, yeah. I've seen it where customers have created multiple site collections, multiple portals, and not understanding, and hence didn't think about the site taxonomy, and then they wanted to roll up across the sites. And they had to realize, you know, learn, you can't, you couldn't do it. So we actually had to do a migration to get from one site collection to the other and kind of redo the site taxonomy. And, and in 2003, it was, it was very difficult, but in 2007, I mean, you can still, you need to think it out thoroughly before you create your site, but it's still, it's not difficult to be able to adjust your site taxonomy within MOS 2007. Okay. Um, and so we talked about top 10 reasons projects fail, uh, but in your experience, both of you, what are maybe top, you know, two or three things that make a SharePoint implementation successful? 
obviously planning. <laughs> so, I guess my big one is, is the user experience and information architecture side. Uh, you know, there's <clears throat> there's all the things we do that are techno technically challenging and uh, you know really add value. But but the other side of the coin that that's really frequently missed is, is that whole UX side where you know you're really looking for adoption. You're really looking <clears throat> the ways people interact with the site and and how they can best do that to, to make it, you know, appealing to them. So I think that that's frequently uh, a lot of where people skimp, either on time or on, or on budget. So, um, you know, they say, well, it's just user experience, right? You know, we, we can do that later. You know, but the, the reality is, is it's very difficult to do that later. So mm -hmm. I think that's one of my big, my big uh, thing points is that, you know, UX and information architecture can really, really save your project in, in terms of usability and the adoption rate. Okay. Christina? Um, good question. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, and it's definitely planning, and, and I agree. I mean, I'm, I'm an end user, and I think, you know, there are some folks here, we're all end users in some capacity that, you know, we want something that's easier, that technology should should give us a little bit of time, make things a little bit better. Obviously, from a, a company standpoint, we want to see ROI on anything that we're investing in. Well, so, you know, absolutely. Mm -hmm. for, for example, um, like I said before, the, the biggest thing was the misconception of what SharePoint can do. SharePoint can do. So being able to have your extranet sites and have all those capabilities and leverage the content management features um, having, you know, having your, your business user edit the content for your extranet and go through a whole approval process, I mean, that's huge. A lot of companies had their old website to where it was very, very hard to maintain. And granted, the implementation for the SharePoint going through that whole process, it may be a lot of work, but once you're done in the long run, you save yourself a lot of time, you save yourself a lot of money within your organization because of how easier it's going to be to maintain. Absolutely. Yeah, I've definitely seen that a lot in, in that we have clients that are, you know, they, they have IT people who are involved in their, in their site updates. <clears throat> and unfortunately for them, the, you know, the IT people don't want to be involved in those activities and the business people don't want them involved in the activities either. So you get a, a situation <laughs> where both groups are unhappy with the situation. Sure. Um, and what SharePoint can do if, if you, if you use it right is really have a nice separation where IT is involved in the development and, administrative tasks that they that they usually want to be involved in and feel as part of their job. And then you have the business and, and the content creators and things like that involved in, in activities that they feel that they actually should be involved with. And there's a nice handoff or division there between the two that SharePoint facilitates. So, you know, neither side is really, you know, involved in things that they don't really want to be involved in. So. Absolutely. Great. Well, we are coming up on our hour, and again, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Christina, Scott, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Again, this webcast was recorded, and the recorded version will be available probably in about a week or so, and definitely we'll send out an email to everybody here when that becomes available. You know, and lastly, um, New Desk, we, we obviously are a Microsoft Gold Certified Partner, a little bit of, of high-level information about us. We have six different practices, one of them being obviously information worker. We also have the user experience practice. And what we'd like to offer today is if there are any additional questions, if you'd like to delve a little bit deeper, um, talking about SharePoint within your environment, Part of what we can offer um, from New Desic is to come to your site and do a lunch session with some of our technical teams, some of our consultants, obviously, as well as your account manager, and really help drill down and make your SharePoint investment work for you. Um, so we can definitely um, offer that as far as a lunch session to come to your environment. We've also been engaging with, with organizations on different architectural design sessions, making sure the foundation is in place. It's like building a house or anything else. We need a, a good cornerstone and a good foundation in order to move forward appropriately. So if you have questions or would like to engage further, please, I will follow up again with all of you via email here momentarily, probably tomorrow. And again, if you have questions, require additional information, please feel free to reach out. Um, so again, thank you all for attending today. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to seeing you on future webcasts.